Hello and welcome to the Autistic Me podcast. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt, speaking as the Autistic Me. Joining us for this episode is George Bailey, the president sleep talker of Z-Pods, a St. Louis, Missouri startup that has developed a line of sensory-friendly sleep pods for children. Listeners and readers know my daughters and I struggle to fall asleep and stay asleep. We have tried blackout curtains, projection lights, classical music, nature sounds. We've also tried sleep tents, extra pillows, and various room configurations. George is the father of five, two of whom are autistic. He understands these challenges with sleep routines. So, George, welcome to the Autistic Me podcast. Thank you so much, Christopher. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we begin talking about the Z-Pod sleep capsules, can we first talk about your background in the autism community and as a neurodiverse individual yourself? So there are a couple of things that really brought me into the autism community. And, and the, the first time where I really became aware that this was going to be a thing in my life was that uh, my wife and I, uh, we got married in uh, 2006. We knew each other for three months before we got married. Uh, it was madness. I don't know if, you know, I'm glad we did it. And yet it just, oh my gosh, if any of my own children do that, I will put my foot down. And so, <laughs> but we did it. And we had a year after we got married, we had a, a beautiful little boy named Joseph, 2007. And shortly thereafter, we moved to Germany. In Germany, it was very obvious very quickly that our son was different, not just, you know, different from the Germans, you know, but I mean, he was, he was different. And we could see by some of his behaviors, uh, it was obvious to us that we were dealing with somebody who was dealing with challenges with which we were not entirely familiar. Uh, some of the more obvious manifestations of this would be that, you know, we'd be sitting in an audience and if people clapped and then Joseph would scream. Now he would clap as well, but he would scream as if out of pain. It was, you know, agony. And so we put two and two together. And after a while, we could see pretty plainly that our son was autistic. There was never, you know, really a kind of moment where I felt like, oh my gosh, I've, you know, I've, I've lost out on fatherhood and stuff like that. I know that a lot of dads go through that. I feel very grateful that I did not. That's not to say that there were not parts of this process that, you know, weren't in any way painful to me or challenging, but I, I've always really embraced my son and been ready for whatever gifts and just wonderful character that he brings to this world. He's a very sweet boy. I'm very grateful for him. But later on, what was very interesting was that the more that we studied uh, my son and, and his condition and, and his traits and, and things like that, the more evident it became to my wife that she was autistic. Now, we've never had her officially diagnosed, nor do we feel like there's really a need to do so, but autism makes her childhood and a lot of her own personal, you know, either frustrations or strengths make a lot of sense. Uh, she's a fantastic woman. Uh, we've been married now almost 16 years, and, and I look forward to the next 16 and onward. But that's been my exposure to the autism world. Thankfully, we came back to St. Louis after three years in Germany, where we met a community of people who really embraced us and really, you know, we felt like we were able to get the services that we need. And you have two children who are autistic, correct? That is correct. We were fortunate enough that uh, one of our friends, we are at a charitable dinner, and one of our friends sat us next to a very well known and prestigious doctor in the field of autism and genomics, whose name is John Constantino. And so we were so lucky. We got to sit next to Dr. Constantino. We talked with him and eventually he took us on as patients, which was great. Uh, Dr. Constantino, part of what he likes to do is if he knows that one of your children is autistic, he will find out what's going on with all the others. And so each of our children have been screened in turn. Madeline, our six-year-old daughter, is autistic. And yet Madeline, as with many other uh, young women and females expresses her autism in a distinctly different way. Uh, she, yeah, I don't think that most unprofessionals would be able to pen it. I don't even think that most autistic people would be able to pen it uh, because she you know, masks so effectively, for lack of a better term. But she, you know, when she has meltdowns, they're pretty severe. And, and she has other little things, little, little like subtleties, the way that she kind of corrects you that stand out as being like, okay, okay, there's there's something there. But as with Joseph, she is a joy and she is a ball of fire. Okay, that girl will just, you know, don't contend with her because she will just, she'll toast you, you know, uh, but a lot of fun. And you yourself have ADHD. 
Correct. So you are a neurodiverse family. And one of the things that our family deals with and your family dealt with was the sleep issue. We tried or have tried melatonin. We have worked with the doctors on stress exercises, blackout curtain, you name it, we've tried it. And sleep is so essential to the development of ourselves. We need that time to recharge, to get ourselves together. Looking over your resume and in mine, we are both, I think it's fair to say, if not highly educated, possibly overeducated. <laughs> yes, overeducated is probably a good word to describe me. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that as, as a pretentious statement of look at me, I'm so smart. It's like, ah, that was you know, maybe a little bit more than I needed, you know, to be able to get out into the professional world. My nine year old. She says, well, I can't sleep because I'm thinking. You speak multiple languages. You have a law degree. You have traveled the world. Does your brain shut off at night? Oh, easily. You know, one of the things that I've got going for me, now my wife, not so much, and I'll get to that in a minute. But one of the things that I have going for me is that I just happen to be a really good sleeper. I do not know why. That's not to say I don't have an active imagination. As a matter of fact, sleep increases imagination, incidentally. You know, that's one of the theories of dreaming as posited in the book, Why We Sleep. Really great book. So uh, my technique for going to sleep is I actually uh, will, I'll take out a flashcard Every night, I have a box of 1,000 Chinese flashcards, and I'll just pick out the next character. And I don't care if I know the character or not, but I'll just focus on that character, and I will write it in my mind. I will intensely focus on that new character, and then I'll try to remember other characters, and I'll just keep on writing them over and over again. That sends me out pretty fast. It's my form of counting sheep. My wife, on the other hand, has never really been that great of a sleeper. Again, you know, one of these kind of giveaways to her, like, you know what, maybe there's something there for me as well. And she tells herself stories I mean, and she, uh, you know, will maybe obsess over something that, you know, a problem that she will just go over and over and over again in her mind. From her perspective, I, I can totally see that. And then, of course, my kids can be wound up at that time as well. Do your young children both have challenges with sleep? Madeline, not so much. Joseph, yes, to the point that I could identify with a lot of the parents that come to us. Now, uh, you know, to be very clear, parents who come to us usually are talking about, you know, three or four hours of sleep a night for their kid. And, and it's really severe. Sometimes as few as two. Some parents claim that their children don't sleep at all, which is, you know, physiologically impossible. Uh, their children, you know, you, you can't survive without sleep, uh, you know, for a prolonged period of time. But it doesn't matter because if the perception is there that you're not getting any sleep at all, you, you're miserable. I don't care how much sleep you're getting, if the perception is there, you're miserable. Now, that being said, Joseph probably was sleeping around six or seven, seven hours a night. You know, it wasn't that bad, but I, I definitely could, I could see what it was like for these parents. We have had sleep studies done for the eldest. We also have cameras that we had used to monitor their, their nighttime. Part of that also was that the, the nine-year-old Lee is a very rough sleeper. She actually has bruises. Ooh, yeah. We put pool noodles on the side of her bed. So when she would hit them, she would hit foam. We put pillows all the way around. Last night when it was bath time, I was looking at her legs and I was like, honey, what is that bruise on your knee? Oh, I hit myself on the bed again. Mm. Putting in cameras was recommended so we could monitor to see how much sleep she was actually getting. When parents say, well, my child isn't sleeping or is only getting two or three hours, that's really hard for some people to believe. But by using the night vision camera, what we found was that, sure enough, she was falling asleep, but it was such a light sleep, she was up and down and up and down. And so the total was probably less than three hours. Wow. At that point, you're not talking about any deep sleep, very little REM sleep. You can see it in the face of someone who doesn't sleep. You can tell something's wrong. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and those kinds of problems, it's interesting to hear you talk about movement. Um, one of the things that we're very determined to do with the sleep technology that we are working to develop right now is to look at clinical trials. You know, And this is a long process. It's very difficult for a startup to be able to put together the budget to be able to do this, but we're very determined for various reasons we can get to later. For now, I'll say that as we put together these sleep trials, one of the things that we want to look at is actual data, sensor data, because, you know, it's one thing to be able to talk about your perception 
you know, as you were going through your perception of what's really going on. It's another thing to be able to actually measure with more precision what is actually happening. Now, the misfortune of doing sleep studies for children with autism is that the most, you cannot get the best data out there available. The only way that you can get really, really, you know, thorough data is with uh, EEG technology. That's where they put all of the electrodes all over you to be able to trace kind of your, your, brain activity and movements and things like that. If you can imagine, uh, you're a nine-year-old autistic child, and you are not about to let somebody plug in 18 to 21 electrodes onto your body. You you won't tolerate it. And so, what we're looking at instead is with actigraphy. Now, incidentally, actigraphy is the measure of movement. So, you were effectively you know, looking at act, actigra- actigraphy-driven study of your daughter and it does, it's actually quite informative. It's amazing how much movement tells us about the quality of our sleep. As you said, the sleep study was very difficult. Mom had to go to the clinic. You know, they use, obviously, it's like a hospital room, which is already uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they give the child a special pillow and sometimes a stuffed animal that they get to keep. Putting on the electrodes is a hour-long process. It's very disruptive. And keeping them on for the night, as you said, it doesn't work well with some autistics. It was a very, I think, a very difficult process for her to go through the formal sleep study. And then yeah. with the video, what we're able to do is prove that, no, her bruises aren't coming from other sources. The bruises are coming from her. Yes. And we'd like to stop this, please. Yeah. And, and what a burden to bear as a parent to know that there's kind of this, you know, this suggestion like, well, is it, you know, how, how's everything at home? How are you guys doing? Do you feel, you know, and we've had that happen once where um, our daughter went down the stairs. This is not our autistic daughter, but she went down the stairs before we do it. Like she was complaining throughout the day. We thought everything was okay, but then it became clear throughout the day. No, it's not. And sure enough, she'd broken her tibia. And the questions and the kind of the the assumptions that go behind there, the the suggestion uh, is very powerful, and it's kind of scary. Parents of special needs children, they go through that routinely. Having been foster to adopt parents, we had the caseworkers in our house every week, sometimes twice a week. You know, every little thing has to be proven. <sighs> yeah, and, and it makes sense because they come from such dark and horrible places in some cases within the foster systems. It's something that's always on my mind is, oh my gosh, you know, what did you do to yourself? Is this self-injurious behavior? Is it intentional or unintentional? And these are all things that autistic individuals experience, myself included. I certainly have under stress the the tendency to rock and roll. And, you know, unfortunately you get hurt when you're not thinking and I have banged right into a wall without even thinking about it. Yes. And so those are things parents do worry about. Let's talk about the Z-Pods in particular. So in 2019, I hope I get this right, Gary Kelman and Jeff Wade decided to start this company. Correct. And you joined very shortly after. Yes. So can you tell us about how and why you joined these two entrepreneurs to create this startup? You know, I feel very fortunate to have come across Gary and Jeff and to have been able to you know, formed friendships with them. We'd actually been, we've known each other since about 2014, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, we all joined the Asian American Chamber of Commerce of St. Louis, really wonderful organization. And we were all on the board of directors and just friends. We knew each other. We knew how we did business. We knew that we were all, you know, smart fellas. And there came a point when Gary and Jeff decided to go into business together. And they had a number of entrepreneurial ventures that were on the table uh, that they were looking at, and they knew that they needed somebody who could communicate. Uh, you know, it's that for me. I'm not really good at a lot of things, uh, but I love I, I love the just the enjoyment of conversation. It's something I actually really. So they said we need a communicator who can help us to kind of pitch all this, and and so they asked uh, me to come on board. At this time, we actually had a number of startups that we were, you know, reviewing, and and one of them was uh, bone conduction headphones. If you've ever seen these kinds of, you know, this kind of technology, very fascinating. Uh, there was a different method for figuring out if somebody diagnosing people with colon cancer, and and you know that was very interesting. Had a lot of promises of business, but this particular one, Z Pods, uh, they had what had happened was Gary had been in China, had stayed in a capsule bed, which if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a bed that is fully enclosed. You get in, you slide a door shut, and you are inside a container, effectively sleeping. 
It's not small per se. It fits a twin size mattress. It's six feet, five inches from end to end. So, you know, you're not, you're not like scrunched up in there. But Gary, uh, when he came home, one of his friends who has some property, uh, rental property on Walt Disney World property, wanted to develop a star or a spaceship themed living space and needed beds that were convincing. And this thing, I mean, it's incredible looking. What they did with this, what they made out of it, but they, they needed the beds. And so Gary, being a professional sourcer, you know, and a professional in logistics and uh, trade and having factories in China and such said, well, you know, I've got exactly the bed, sold him a, a half a container of those beds and then took the remaining half and set them up in a showroom in St. Louis. And we would sit around these beds and just scratching our heads being like, what do we do with these? Like, there's got to be a market. You know, there's got to be a market. Finally, uh, somebody suggested that we go with autism. I balked at that. The first two or three times that that was said, I brushed it aside because my personal feelings are that within the autism community, there is a lot of just kind of stuff being sold and with no real science to back it. And so, and you'll notice this is something I say in every interview, in every conversation that I have with a prospect, we say, we do not make medical claims. Okay. I can't say that enough. We don't make medical claims. We don't, you know, we know we have anecdotes is what you have. And an anecdote is not weak, but it's not the same. It's it's very strong, a matter of fact, and, and it's very compelling. Um, you know, if it happens enough, then, it, you know, but th- this got me to the point where I felt like if we're going to do this, we're going to do a couple of things. One is we're going to be very ethical about this. And then number two is that we're going to do studies, you know, which again, takes a long time. We're saving up to do them. And that's how we got started. We asked a lot of people in the autism community, what do you guys think? And I kind of thought they were going to brush it off like I did. But actually, universally, they said, this actually looks like it has the hallmarks of, you know, of being a very helpful solution. And then I would ask, like, but why? And the more I learned, the more I felt like, okay, I see what we're doing. And I love it. And it's fun. As a child, I would crawl under my bed to sleep because it was a dark, enclosed space. I still mummy at night to avoid the light. I have sleep masks. We've got, as I said, the blackout curtains. Several of my my colleagues who work and travel in the Asia Pacific countries have talked about how the best sleep they get is at some of these hotels in Macau, in Shanghai. I'll mention that it's kind of like being in the old fashioned sleeper cars, the old Pullman train. Except instead of a curtain, you're you're closing a door. Yes. For those who aren't familiar with the concept here, they are boxes. They are six and a half to seven feet long, depending on the design in the hotel uh, or the place you're staying or the train. Some of the high-speed trains in China have these now. And it's a capsule. You go in, you slide the door shut. They have controlled lighting. They have ventilation. So they're fairly elaborate. Yeah. These aren't just cardboard boxes your kid has climbed into. <laughs> These are typically insulated, so they they deaden the sound. So they have set sound deadening properties. They have, as I said, lighting that you can control using your, your phone or your tablet. So how does a Z-Pod compare to these capsules that you see in long distance travel in Asia, in some of the hotels and the hostels? How does it compare? It's very, very similar uh, in the sense that, you know, we were actually sourcing them from China. So you would see basically the same features. You're right that it does have sound deadening properties, though I do, you know, make sure the parents understand. You're talking more about muffling sound than killing it altogether. The only way you can kill sound altogether is by removing all air. And seeing as how that's a non starter, we're not going there. You know, <laughs> again, we're ethical. Okay. So, so, uh, but I, I have to go back and just say, I am delighted to hear your own story because it's not, you know, I talk mostly with children. We do have a few young adults that we've worked with, but to hear adults talk about this experience from their own perspective and memories of sleeping under the bed. We regularly talk with moms and dads whose children are sleeping in the closet or under the bed and such. But going back to the design, now what we're doing differently is that we sourced until we got to the point where like, okay, we think we understand what this bed needs more to be even more specifically attuned to the needs of these sleepers. And because, you know, as far as we can we were concerned, the bed itself was never designed for autistic children or other autistic sleepers. But the bed was designed for autistic children and other autistic sleepers. It, w- it was almost serendipitous. But we wanted to take it another step and say, okay, tell us. And we talked to 
every parent and every child that we could, what do you want to see in addition? And we got some really great feedback. And based on that, we are now making a made in USA bed manufactured here in the United States, uh, Baxter, Minnesota. And it's going to incorporate a lot of the upgrades that were suggested to us within the autism community. And that, that's been really fun. And actually to be able to you know, make stuff, uh, to be able to make something new, that's been very exciting. So the bed itself reminds me of the Rubbermaid sheds and garden equipment that you get. It comes flat. It's, it's plastic. It's formed, vacuum formed. And then what you do is you assemble it at home from this flat piece. Yes. But it does have the features of these more elaborate systems that you see overseas reading the specs and and I'd I'd be curious where how this all works out but it has speakers for bluetooth correct again just like the hotels do where you you use your phone and you tell it to pair and you listen to the speakers it does have air ventilation led lighting and for those parents who are really brave i guess they could mount a ipad or a, a tv in it if they really wanted to the ipad tv thing is there uh, mainly for let's say that somebody runs a uh, they build sensory rooms in that case i'm actually um, i'm a huge fan of being able to mount a, te- mount a television because then you can add elements to it or have something maybe some wavy imagery or something that's further soothing because the purpose of the sensory room is to soothe and to calm uh, in terms of television in a bedroom, if you're in a bedroom setting, I actually don't recommend it. The, you know, I think that it's pretty well established. I, I, I say that with some caveat, you know, but it's pretty well established that television before bedtime is really not good for you. Blue light, things like that. And so, but if a parent says, no, I insist, then you know what? That parent knows their child better than I do. And I'm not going to get into the business of kind of micromanaging their par- their parenting, but we do include it because it, it's fun and, and there are different possibilities that it, it opens up in terms of, you know, audience. One of the things we have done is we have set the fire tablets that the girls have, the Amazon fire tablets, they, they shut off at seven. Yes. And I think that's really important to say. One of the things we found as parents, and I don't know, again, it's anecdotal, but science does seem to support this idea is we do in the screen time a half hour before bed. Yes. And a lot of research has supported that as well as the doctors that we work with trying to help the, the girls with their stress and their sleep. Yeah. So both Ann and Lee have to give up screen time a half hour before bed. And that includes television. We don't just stop watching TV and go to bed. We have quiet reading time first. There's something very important about the aspect of ritual, you know, before bedtime. And, you know, what we've decided is that uh, we will recommend to parents certain things about sleep hygiene that have nothing to do with the bed itself. You know, because the goal between us and them, we are working together collaboratively to create both an ideal sleep environment, but also to encourage uh, healthy sleep habits that we think are really good for for children to observe and for adults for that matter. Some of the tips that you get from autistics and other neurodiverse individuals, those with ADHD, OCD, uh, PTSD, when they talk about sleep, some of the things that I've heard and then adopted might sound strange at first, but expansion foam in hollow core doors. Most of your doors in your home are plastic, you know, except for the exterior doors. You can drill a small hole and use expansion foam and it actually deadens the sound. Yeah. Well, little things like that, the the blackout curtains were, I had never realized that you could get lined curtains that block more of the light. I just bought curtains. These little things that you find out from a community that you may not have been aware of always help. And I think that that's what you're commenting on is your company wants to listen to the community and then take some of those ideas from the community and apply those to the Z-Pod. Yes. I would say that's very accurate. And a matter of fact, I feel like one of the really wonderful results of having started with the autism community, because that's not where we're going to end. Naturally, as with any company, we're, you know, we want to grow. We want to be able to uh, help as many people as possible. But one of the virtues of starting with this community, and this is actually kind of a message for all entrepreneurs and businesses out there, is that when you take the time to focus on the needs of a specific community, particularly one as truly diverse internally as the autism community, you're going to find that they will push the limits of your creativity because they need a lot of flexibility. And so our goal, of course, is then flexibility. You know, we want to be able to provide something that makes everybody happy. And there is something to say for if you want to make everybody happy, you're going to make no one happy. You know, it's the, but, but in terms of creating something that is multimodular, that can adapt itself 
to the specific needs or specific sleep profile of a given individual, I think that that's very desirable. And the fact of the matter is that all of us, we all come with you know, uh, different packaging and we all come with different ideas about what it is. Uh, you know, l- look at the act of sleep. What is actually happening? A- at a given point, you lose so much of, you know, what, what we technically call, you know, arousal or, you know, being so alert, you know, during the day. You lose so much of that that you just, you drift out, you're gone. But if you continue in that state, you know, it's both called arousal and vigilance. And you, if you if you continue in that state, it's really difficult to sleep. But what gets one person very excited will not work for another person. And so, what could, you know relaxes one person doesn't do it for another person. We're all built so differently, and the autism community, in a way, makes this obvious very quickly. And that allows us to be able to innovate with a little bit more flexibility than otherwise. So I, I feel we, we were very fortunate to have started with this community. Autism will always have a place, not just in my heart, because I'm a father of you know five, two with autism, but also in the heart of the business, because we know that it was in the autism community that we were given a chance. When you talk about business and autism, you've already mentioned this, but it is a genuine concern for advocates like myself, just how much stuff is out there in these autism magazines, on these autism websites, flotation chambers, pressure chambers, sleep pills that are not FDA approved in any way, shape, or form, therapies that have questionable value. How do we approach this as consumers? As you said, you make no medical claims and you're very clear about that. You hope to do studies. How do we work with companies to quite honestly, avoid the pressure to buy things to solve the the problems that our, our children are experiencing when you can't always just throw money at solving these problems? Yeah, that's such a great question. I don't know if I can give the most satisfactory answer, but it's, and yet, that's a question I think about very often, you know, because I, uh, I, I get guilty easy. <laughs> you know, I feel like if I'm ever like feeling guilty, you can see it on my face. I don't have a good poker face. I feel pretty kind of vulnerable to, you know, that idea, like, am I just working people, you know? And, and so I have to ask myself that. And, and I can't, I don't want to lay judgment on another company, you know, for these kinds of practices for the very same reason that I hope that people would be slow to judge us and our t- intentions. That being said, um, I do think that it's okay to have a little bit of puffery and commercial advertising. I mean, certainly U.S. culture is allowed for that. You know, the, constitutionally speaking, from a, a legal background myself, you know, that, that puffery is okay. Uh, as long as everybody knows that the puffery is happening. You know, when Utah says, for example, we're the best snow on earth, you know, is that quantitatively established? No, not at all. You know, but at the same time, recognize that puffery exists and make yourself literate as a consumer. So that you know the right questions to ask. And we welcome that. You know, I love talking on the phone with, you know, potential customers. And when they ask me the hard questions, you know, what is your plastic made out of? What about this? You know, what, you know, can a kid uh, get injured this way in the bed and things like that? Then I I enjoy those conversations and I'd like to open up and just be honest and say, okay, this is what happens here. And we've even told a, a number of parents who have talked about their kids with particularly destructive tendencies and said, very honestly, I, I don't think that this is a good fit for you. Because at the end of the day, what I don't want is an unhappy consumer because they're going to make my life very unpleasant. And, you know, that being said, you know, I think that we've had a couple run-ins where I feel like we made mistakes that were not good for the consumer, you know, where our, our shipping didn't work out the way that we had hoped that it would. And, and now I've learned. You can only hope that the people with whom you do business are doing so in good faith. But there has to come a time where you just have to try stuff and you have to be adventurous. You have, I am very grateful for the early adopter who said, I'm going to take a chance on your guys' solution. And many, many, many of those early adopters have come back saying, I love this. But we recognize that it's really, you know, it's those early adopters that make things happen. One of the things that is on your website is a trial period, a satisfaction guarantee. Yes, that's correct. And comparing similar products or, or at least differentiated uh, sleeping solutions, a lot of them don't offer anything similar. You offer three months of basically see if it works. That's a pretty substantial trial period. 
Yeah, it, it, it does come with qualifications. Um, you know, for example, if it doesn't work, then you need to hold on to it for about two weeks while we resolve finding in a new home. Uh, we don't want to just throw the bed away. And, you know, it, we have had, I think, one case where uh, we had a customer who was not, it just felt like she wasn't unhappy. She, she liked the bed. Her kid loved the bed, but it wasn't doing what she needed. We needed a little bit of time to put together and find a new home for the bed. And then we took it, we donated. Uh, later on, I think that we would like to be able to establish, and this, you know, again, this is, a, this is a future plan, not something that's currently in action, but we want to establish a 501c3 foundation so that we can take those beds and then you know you would donate the bed, write it off, and, and we would give it to a family in the area because we have a lot of families who want this bed and then donate to them and hope that it would work for them. But we do want people to have the confidence that we're not out there just to kind of like, ah, oh, you're stuck with it. But I will say we have a high degree of confidence that your child is going to love the bed. I mean, even, our, even in our worst case scenarios, we've never had a situation where Junior just doesn't care for the bed. That's not what we're talking about. You know, they, they love it. As we wind up the discussion of the beds, the, the Z-Pods, I will have the link to the website in the show notes. Uh, for those interested, it's zpodsforsleep.com, and I'll have that link in the show notes. The beds, like so much else uh, right now, especially furniture, it's, they're not cheap. My wife and I are looking at a replacement bed for our master suite, Beds are, quite honestly, they're just one of the more expensive things you will buy for a household. True. Uh, we've looked at you know some of the higher end mattresses, some of the adjustable mattresses for my wife and I, and it's not uncommon to see prices that are well over five thousand dollars. Your beds are right in that range, and that's actually for a capsule. It's very competitive, but it is it's not cheap. Ideally, it's a high quality construction. It's a regular twin size mattress that fits inside. But you are going to pay for the engineering involved, the manufacturing involved, the fact that it's made in the USA. This does require significant thought on the part of the parents or the individual buying it for his or herself if they would fit into it. So you offer some financing options. There are other ways to approach this. But I want consumers to know and listeners to know this isn't a matter of your product just being expensive. My wife and I looked at our local furniture store. And I just, I nearly had a heart attack finding out what a mattress costs today. I, I appreciate the fairness. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of funny to me is, you know, we, we have two different ways of pointing out, we have two different people who will point out to us that we're expensive. Uh, number one, well, actually, I'd say three. Number one is parents who feel desperate and just like, oh, I wish I could get this for my kid, but I can't spend that kind of money. I would tell those parents, please, get in touch with us because we will talk you through different ways. And we've had some very amazing parents get it funded by the state uh, in states like Missouri, Minnesota, California, and a few other states. Um, so we've had a lot of good you know, success there. And then we have the set, you know, so that for that group of parents, if it's just like you feel desperate, but you can't, please contact us. I mean, like we, we are working on solutions and some of them are not going to be available yet. That's one of the reasons why we're doing case studies or, or clinical trials is because in the long term, if we can get this thing through, funded through insurance, which, you know, is the ultimate ambition of every startup that sells anything that has any therapeutic value, then of course we want to go there by all means. But then the second group is more aggressively like angry at us you know, like, how could you cha charge $5,000? And and I'm sympathetic to them. It's, it's like, because, you know, in their hearts, w what's causing them to be angry? It's because they know, like we know, that most families of autistic children are already spending a lot of money. They want to know that we're not just in it to, you know, to treat this as a cash cow. You know, I, I let them know just like, hey, you know, by the way, I want to, I, I totally understand that you're upset about this. Here's what we're doing. So we take a similar approach, you know, and then there's a third, you know, one that, that's out there basically accusing us of gouging the customer. And, and that, that to me, like really not just angry, but like saying that we're, you know, acting in bad faith. And, and there's not much you could say to that. You know, I, I think that that person uh, lacks a certain understanding of what it takes to bring a new idea to market. That all good things start out at a heavy cost. But then over time, as we get better, then these things become more accessible. I mean, like, look at your cell phone. You know, if I were charging $4,000 for a brick of a cell phone, 
you know, that you'd just be like, that's ridiculous, you know, and, and yet 30 years later after the, you know, or 40 years, whatever, after the advent of the brick cell phone, all of us have one. And so I say to that last group, give it time, you know, give it time. This is something we are, we are, it's not as if we are interested in keeping this expensive. You know, we actually really do want to do things to drive the cost down and, and to make it more accessible, not less, to make it possible for more consumers to purchase it, not fewer. I, I think that the cost concern is, it, it is certainly the number one concern that we get from parents, and we are constantly working on it. You are involved in the autism community, so you're not only listening to autistics and the caregivers of autistics through this company, but you started off. You are on several boards related to autism. You are involved through your church. Those are important connections, and I I want people to understand that those of us who are autistic, and many of us are entrepreneurs. Uh, My wife and I have owned businesses. I freelance. We understand that the conflict there of cost versus benefit, and we understand that, but you are part of the community. You're not an outsider trying to make money off of autism or neurodiversity. You are a caregiver, you are involved, and you understand this is a very difficult situation financially and justifying costs and choosing, basically choosing which battles to try to win for your child. Very true. And yet, that being said, I don't consider myself enough of an insider that I didn't balk at the beginning of this journey. That that was one of the really big factors. It's like, look, I'm an autism dad, but you know, I, I I'm not the person who's going through this, and and I won't pretend to know what that's like. I mean, to this day, if you ask me to really define autism, I can't. You know, I I, I can define my son to a certain extent, at least to the extent that um, I love him. I know his traits. I know what makes him happy. I know how to get him excited. I know how to make him upset. Uh, My daughter, same thing. You know, just like I know any of my kids, I am an expert in Joseph, Madeline, and my three other children. In being received into the autism community the way that I have been, I can accept it with nothing other than gratitude. Um, It is an honor to be able to uh, communicate with and learn from my autistic brothers and sisters. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, my church involvement. Uh, I feel grateful that, you know, I I have a son who is very obviously and outwardly different from the other young men in our church. And they're amazing with him. And they're so kind to him. So to your kind of broader message, kind of the advocacy message of what we're trying to do for the autism community, uh, I just want to send a a message of just like love and acceptance. And, you know, and I hope to get that back because it's a great feeling. Uh, I I think that we ought to lend each other as much um, grace as possible, as we said before the program, because most people are really trying to do something good. And I think that that's something that I hope that comes through with every interview and every guest on the podcast is we don't all have to agree. We don't all have to have the same perspective. We come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different experiences. Autism, my autistic traits versus those of my daughters are not the same. My daughters are not the same in in their neurodiversity. Totally. Even their ADHD is different. Uh, one hyper focuses, one cannot focus, <laughs> for lack of a better description. Yeah, and they're, they're both ADHD, but it, it, it's different for different people. Yes. And, and so we do need to be a lot kinder and gentler. And maybe we have a right to argue for our opinions and state our cases and use evidence. Absolutely. And I think that's very important. We need to use evidence. Like you said, you, you want to do studies for the bed. We need to rely on evidence, not anecdotes, not always emotion. But I really appreciate your perspective as as respecting that your children are the autistic individuals and you learn from them. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I want to thank George Bailey for joining us on the Autistic Me podcast. He is, again, with the company Z-Pods. They work on a capsule bed that may help neurodiverse individuals, but Quite honestly, though, they're popular everywhere outside of the United States. So I hope that uh, we see we see this market grow and expand for those who find it a better way to sleep and a better way to recharge. 
Thank you, Christopher. I appreciate your time and thank you for joining us on the podcast. Absolutely. It's been very fun.